Hi, Bayless Conley here. I want to welcome you to the broadcast today. You know, I'm going to be talking about Jesus today. There is nothing or no one as important as Him. Hearing messages about Jesus strengthens our faith, it strengthens our resolve, it draws us closer to God. Jesus is the message. So if you got a Bible, why don't you grab it and let's sit down, get into the Word of God together today as we talk about Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high." I want you to pay attention to those words. God in these last days has spoken to us by His Son. Not just through the teaching that we have in the Bible that Jesus gave, not just through the words that He spoke, but through His action, through His lifestyle, God has spoken to us through Jesus. So much so that it declares in verse 3 that Jesus is the brightness of the Father's glory, and He is the express image of His person. It's the same term used in Greek language for the minting of a coin when they would imprint a, uh, a figure on a coin. It might be, you know, Caesar, a Roman emperor, or our coins. Bang, you get your nickel. Who is that? Well, that is Abraham Lincoln on there. That is what that word means. It's the exact representation of another. You want to see what God is like? Jesus is the exact imprint of the Father. He is the express image of God. The New International Version says He is the exact representation of His being. The New American Standard says He is the exact representation of His nature. To see Jesus is to see the Father. Listen to these words that Jesus spoke. You don't need to turn there, but just listen. John 14, verse 7. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet have you not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us, the Father. To know Jesus is to know the Father. To see Jesus is to see the Father. He is not a close facsimile. He's the exact representation of God. The express image of His nature, the express image of His person, the express image, the exact image of His character. As we see how Jesus dealt with injustice, it's a revelation of the will and the heart of God towards injustice. As Jesus lifted the broken and the downtrodden, it shows us the heart of God and the will of God. We could say it this way, Jesus is the will of God in action. He even said himself, I don't say words unless they come from the Father. I only do what I've seen from my Father. Jesus is just not a close representation of the Father. He is exact in every way. So much so, look in verse 8 of Hebrews 1. And previously, God says this to the angels. He talks about ministers, etc. But in verse 8, but to the Son, He says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. He calls the Son God. Jesus is deity. He and the Father are one. And I'll say it again, Jesus is the will of God expressed perfectly and exactly. He's the will of God in action. And listen to me, faith begins at the known will of God. What I want to do this morning, and we're 
going to be fairly brief. I want to look at three areas. I'm going to look at disease, defilement, and desertion. Disease, defilement, and desertion. And I'll explain, explain those as we go along. And see Jesus in action regarding those things. And as we do, I know this is simple, but it can change your life. We find out the will of God. That's why the Bible says, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. How can we know it? One way we can know it for sure, settle it for eternity, is to look at Jesus. He is the exact representation of the nature, of the character, of the person of God. Jesus said, if you've known me, you've known the Father. If you've seen me in action, you've seen the Father in action. So let, let's look at the first part, disease. How did Jesus treat, what, had he, what did he do with those that were grappling with sickness and disease? Now, I want you to just listen, because I'm going to go kind of rapid fire, and we're just going through one of the Gospels. These are not all of the verses. We could come up with many, many more, but this will definitely give you a pretty clear idea. Matthew 4 and 24, listen to it. It says, Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Matthew 8 and verse 16. When the evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Chapter 12 and verse 15. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Chapter 14 and verse 14. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. Chapter 15 and verse 30. Then great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, the mute, the blind, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet, and he healed them. Chapter 19, verse 2. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. Chapter 21, verse 14. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Jesus never found one person in all of those multitudes that it was not the Father's will to heal. Not one. There is no record in your Bible, anywhere in any of the Gospels, that Jesus ever turned down a single person that came to him for healing. He healed them all in every single instance, those that came to him. And we didn't read just about a multitude, but multitudes, plural, time and time again, multiplied thousands of people with every kind of affliction, and Jesus healed them all. He never said to one person, sorry, you know, I'd like to, but I can't. It's not the Father's plan for you. No, Jesus healed them all. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's the exact representation of the Father. Now, I don't have all the answers, neither does anyone else. And I'm not going to have all the answers till I get to heaven. But you know what I'm not going to do? And, and just, just in, in all transparency, there's a couple things I'm trusting God for when it comes to my own physical health right now. Haven't experienced them yet, but faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Haven't seen it yet. In the meantime, I've got faith. I am trusting God. But what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to say, all right, well, I didn't experience this, and so I'm going to pull my theology down to the level of my experience against everything that Jesus' life and his words and his actions shout to us in bold print, said, well, I know that, but this is my experience. And so what I believe, you know, it, it, it has to all do with what I've experienced. No, I am endeavoring to go from faith to faith, from glory to glory. I'm trying to raise my level to the experience, uh, I mean, to the, the revelation of the promises and the revelation of Jesus' life. I wish I had all the answers, but unfortunately I don't. I do know this. We're living in a fallen world. Not everything functions the way God originally designed it to function. One day he's going to make a new heavens and a new earth, and the Bible says there'll be no sickness and no pain, no disease there. Just like God's original Eden plan, it was not part of God's original plan. So a whole lot of things have gone wrong, and just the outworking of man's sin since the beginning of creation has caused a lot of problems. The scripture says even the earth groans and travails, waiting for that day. 
I do know we have an adversary, the devil. Jesus said he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He comes to devour, Peter said. And if you read in the Gospels, there are occasions where Jesus specifically attributed an illness to the work of the devil a number of times. In fact, you can read in Luke 13, there was a woman bowed over for 18 years, some sort of an arthritic condition. And the, the people were, you know, the religious leaders didn't want Jesus healing her. It was the wrong day. Poor Jesus never did figure out the right day to heal people on. So it's the Sabbath. And Jesus, you know, in anger looks at them and says, Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound for 18 years, shouldn't she be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day? And then we read Peter's words in Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with a Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. So we find occasion where it's, it's you know, directly attributed to the devil and we know we're living in a fallen world. We do know it was never part of God's original plan. Now I may go to heaven with unanswered questions, but I will not go to heaven blaming God. I had an individual recently come to see me, and I knew that they had certain things in their mind regarding an incident that had happened years before. There was someone that had done some things and created a huge mess, and rather than take responsibility, they actually blamed me, told a big fat lie, and said that, that I had done, and, and I hadn't. They actually had blamed it on me. And I, I got several letters, mostly anonymous from people, really nasty letters, telling me what a bad person I was because I'd done this. I'm thinking, I know who's been talking to you. And uh, of course, anonymous, you can't answer them back. And this individual, I know that the, the person had talked to them and um, had had a, maybe a bit of a deal, but I felt like God said, you just need to keep your mouth shut. I'm your vindication. You don't say anything. It's sort of been years. I never said a word. Just, hey, you've got to live with your thoughts, not me. Think whatever you want. And they came and they, they brought it up. And so I said, well, since you ask, this is actually what happened. And they were astonished to find out that the person that had accused me was actually responsible for what they'd accused me of. That they were actually the ones that had done it. Just astonished. And I think the devil who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, who walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, you know, afflicts people and then whispers in their ear, isn't God terrible? Look what he's done. How could you trust someone like this? How could you serve someone like this? How could you worship someone that would do this? He's cruel. Well, friend, the devil is a liar. But unfortunately, there are some people that unwittingly reinforce that. I remember as a young Christian, seeing another new believer. I, I, I didn't know the guy, but knew I knew the guys that led him to Christ, and he got saved shortly after I did. I'm driving my little micro bus through the park one day, and I see him, and I recognize, oh, that's the guy. And as he's walking, he's bowed over, and it looks like he has the weight of the world on his shoulders. You know, he, he, he looked so downcast. I pulled off to the side of the road, jumped out of my bus, ran over and said, hey, you don't know me. My name's Bayless. I understand you accepted Christ recently. I said, what's going on, man? You look like you got some troubles. Can I pray for you? And he goes, well, I don't know. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I got all this stuff that's just happened in my life in the last few weeks since I got saved. I, I'm sick, and he talked about this terrible illness that he just, you know, had, had contracted. He had some other thing going on. This had happened. This had happened. And he said, and the guys that led me to Christ, when I talked to them about this, they said God was doing it to me. He said, I don't understand. Why is God wailing on me? He said, I live for the devil, and then I give my life to Jesus, and now God is picking on me. Why? And I said, you know what? I'm pretty new to this thing myself. I just started reading the Bible. I said, but I'm going to venture to say something. I don't think God's doing this to you. I don't think God's responsible for all these bad things that are happening. In fact, you know the scripture speaks to that, and it's a really unique couple of verses, and I'd like you to look um, at them with me, if you would. If you have your Bible, turn to Isaiah 59. Many years ago, I was in a minister's conference, and uh, 
Jamie Buckingham spoke. Pastor a great church in Florida. He's been in heaven for quite a few years now. He was a prolific writer. He wrote uh, Crossing the Switchblade, Run Baby Run, Daughter of Destiny, um, you know, Nikki Cruz's story, Catherine Kuhlman's story, and a lot of other things. And he used to write, you know, uh, monthly periodicals that I just devoured. He was brilliant with a pen, very deep thinker and funny. And they announced, we're at this minister's meeting, they announced, okay, you know, this session is Jamie Buckingham. He found out he was speaking when they invited him to come up with a platform. That's not a good thing. Somehow the schedule got mixed up and he wasn't planned at all, had nothing prepared. But he shared some brilliant thoughts, made everybody mad, and I really liked that. <laughs> but one of the things he shared with these verses, and he told a story how he had just led a guy to Christ. And as I recall, the guy had come from a pretty hardcore criminal background, a very, you know, just a dark background, living hard for the devil, had a glorious salvation experience. And then a couple of weeks after he got saved, he got testicular cancer. And Jamie shared a thought about it from these verses we're going to read. And you know, a lot of times you'll find promises and prophecies in the Bible, in particular in the Old Testament, that had a number of applications. It specifically spoke to a situation going on in that day, but there's a prophetic element that it pointed forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. And sometimes, in addition to that, there would be another layer that there was just a biblical principle that you can apply to life. And what we're going to read, you find all three applications here. Check it out, Isaiah 59 and verse 14. Justice is turned back. Righteousness stands afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. I want you to notice, the one who departs from evil makes himself a prey. That's not P-R-A-Y, that's P-R-E-Y. In other words, they get assaulted, they get attacked. And the Lord saw it, and he was happy because he was the one that was attacking them. No, the Lord saw it, and it displeased him. In the next verse... He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him and his own righteousness it sustained him. Of course, that is prophetic about the coming of Jesus who put an eternal fix on this problem. Jesus, you know, came and he is the great intercessor that stands between God and men and through him we come to God. But then the application right across the board is when people, they can be living the wrong way, doing evil, you know, they turn from evil, they come to God and we need to intercede for them. We need to cover them in our prayers. We need to set a hedge around about them and pray. Otherwise, they become a P-R-E-Y if we don't P-R-A-Y. And friend, new converts are especially vulnerable. And of course the devil goes after them. He's just lost them. Like that young man I talked to in the park. You know, he, he, he comes to Christ and all of a sudden all these things start happening. Is God pleased? No, God is not pleased. Is God responsible? No, God was not responsible. God was looking for someone to stand in the gap. And of course, Jesus ultimately does that. But then we need to take that place as intercessors. When people don't know their rights and privileges, we need to go to God on, on their behalf and pray for them and intercede for them. So the point overall that I'm making is this. Jesus, again, he is the representation of God's will. Is God pleased when justice fails? Is God pleased when truth doesn't enter? Is God pleased when people that turn from evil make themselves a prey and they're assaulted and attacked? No, God is not pleased. He's displeased. And he sent Jesus to fix the problem to be the great intercessor. Jesus is the perfect expression of the will of the Father. To see Jesus is to see the Father. To know Jesus is to know the Father. Now look with me at John chapter 8. I want to move on from disease to defilement. And by that, I just mean sin. When we sin, we soil ourselves spiritually. We defile ourselves before God. John chapter 8, we want to see how Jesus... Deals with sin and with sinners. 
John chapter 8, verse 3. And the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. When they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. And Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. And when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Now, these religious leaders that brought the woman, they're a fine bunch, aren't they? This woman was caught in adultery in the very act. She was doing it when we caught her. <laughs> really, how did that come about? Either you set it up or you've been peeping through people's windows. <laughs> sneaking around, looking through bedroom windows all over town. And by the way, where's the guy? If she was caught in the very act. They had no desire for justice. They had no desire for truth. They were just trying to trap Jesus. And don't you love, they were ready to stone her. Jesus chases them away with his incredible wisdom. Where's your accusers? Nobody's condemning you. He said, neither do I. The Son of Man didn't come to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. God is full of forgiveness. He's full of mercy. And I think people forget that. Sometimes church people forget where they've come from. Forget about the times they've stumbled and how God's had mercy on them and they're ready to pick up a stone and just do someone else in for their trespasses. I remember reading a book years ago about a pastor in American Samoa. And there was a man and woman in the church had committed adultery and both families were devastated, but the woman that had been involved in the affair came and confessed. And the pastor said that the whole church knew about it, the whole little town, everybody in town knew about it. And he says, and that Sunday morning, you know, the woman is there with her husband now, and she's just broken. The other woman from the other, you know, marriage is there, but her husband's not at church. And he said, I preached hellfire to them. I pounded on my pulpit. He said, you could have smelled the sulfur of hell from my sermon, how God was going to judge sinners and adulterers and they had no part in the kingdom of God. And he says, I just went after them hammer and tong. He says, the people respectfully sat there. Service got done and everybody in the church got up and walked out. He says, it was really odd, so I followed them. And they walked into the little town there and they all stood out in the front yard of the man who hadn't come to church, the guy that had committed adultery. And they began to sing hymns and songs about the love of God and the mercy of God about the forgiveness of Jesus. And they just continued to sing about God's love and about his mercy and about his forgiveness. And some of them called out, we love you, brother. And eventually the door opened and the man came out sobbing and he walked out and fell into their arms, completely broken, repenting, sobbing his guts out. They gathered around and laid hands on him and prayed for him and confirmed their love to him. And the pastor said, I felt so ashamed. He said, my people knew far more about the nature and character of God than I did myself. Now, the balance to that, the divine tension with that, is the remainder of what Jesus said to the woman. He says, no one's you know, condemning you. I don't condemn you either, but go and sin no more. You can't, God is merciful, but we can't have a flippant attitude about sin. Break it off. Don't keep going. Well, oh, God's merciful. His mercies are new every morning, so no big deal. No, it is a big deal. You know, in John chapter 5, there's the guy who's been paralyzed 38 years, laying by the pool of Bethesda. Jesus heals him, and what does Jesus say? Go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Now, I don't know what's worse than being paralyzed for 38 years, laying on a mat outside, but apparently there's something. And Jesus said, if you don't change and break it off, you're going to open the door to the worst things. And I really think that's God's heart in it. You know, a, a flippant attitude about sin 
A flippant attitude about the grace of God opens the door to the devil and opens the door to stuff we just don't want happening in our lives. And so God is incredibly merciful. But the balance of that is, hey, once you repent, make the decision, you're not going to do it again. Don't treat the grace of God lightly. You know, I love talking about Jesus. And I have to tell you, in today's message, you know, we only got through part of it, at least as far as the broadcast went. I shared three important points. We only got to two of them due to our allotted time. So I'd encourage you to get the message and uh, hear the third point about Jesus being the clear expression of God's will. You know, sometimes we go through stuff and it can feel like God's a million miles away, but He is not. The Bible says He is an ever-present help in time of need, that He never leaves us, never forsakes us. And I just want to leave you with this thought. God is there with you. He knows what's going on, and He wants to help you. Call on the name of His Son today. You won't be disappointed. We'll see you next time. Perhaps as you watch today's program, you are struggling with an illness, or you're tired of the weight and stress upon your life and feel a sense of brokenness. Jehovah Rapha is the name for God that means, I am the Lord who heals you. God is, by His very nature, a healer. He is a God of health, healing, and wholeness. Today, Bayless has a message about the healing power of God that he would like you to have. It's a single CD message called Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. And it's our gift to you, our way of blessing you. Use the information on your screen with your gift to support this television outreach. Your support is why Answers with Bayless Conley is able to be here today, on air, to bring you this message of hope and encouragement, and to reach out across our nation and around the world, revealing hope to the lost, bringing answers from God's Word to life's deep and most difficult questions. Your support is also very important to us, which is why we want to thank you for your gift today by sending you a CD copy of Bayless's powerful message, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. Use the information on the screen or visit the Answers website. Grasp the importance of God's role as divine healer and learn to access the healing power of God's nature.